The SI100 from Thermalright is a low or a lower profile CPU cooler that sells for 23 to 27 USD. But is it any good? Let's find out. What's up everyone, Eric here and welcome to Hardware for Gamers. For those of you who are new to the channel, I test and review PC cases, CPU coolers, PC case fans, and graphics cards. Before I get into this overview to have full disclosure, Thermalright did send me this cooler to test and review, but as always, all opinions expressed in this video are mine. So if you do end up liking this video, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel because it really does help a lot. Now onto the overview. There are three versions of the SI100. There is the SI100, the SI100 Black, and the SI100 White ARGB. These sell for between 23 and 27 USD on Amazon.com. Okay, let's go over what you get in the box. There is the heat sink and fan, of course. There is an installation guide. There are two sets of fan clips. One set is for a standard fan, and the other set is for a slim fan. There's a small tube of thermal compound and the mounting hardware for Intel and AMD. Taking a closer look at the heatsink, there are six six millimeter continuous copper heat pipes. The cold plate is also copper, while the fins are aluminum. There is a nickel coating on the heatsink, heat pipes, and cold plate, which is why it looks so shiny. Moving on to the fan, the fan is a Thermalrite TLE12. It has a four pin PWM connector, there are seven blades. It has rubber covers on all the corners. The bearing is Thermalrite's SFDB V2 bearing, so that it is a fluid dynamic bearing. And it has a max rated RPM of 2000. Okay, the dimensions of this cooler with the fan attached is 100 millimeters high by 120 millimeters wide by 130 millimeters deep. Based off these dimensions, there could be RAM clearance issues. Now, Thermalrite has allowed for up to 50 millimeters. This means most non-ARGB DIMMs will fit. However, ARGB DIMMs will likely not fit. And even if they could fit with how the heatsink is orientated here, you wouldn't be able to see them. For socket compatibility, the SI100 is compatible with most mainstream Intel sockets and is also compatible with Intel's HPC sockets as well. For AMD compatibility, it's compatible with AM4 and AM5. Moving on to how to install the CPU cooler, I will be installing it on an AM4 motherboard. The installation between Intel and AMD sockets is different, so if you are planning on installing it onto an Intel socket, please check the installation guide. As always, before you start, make sure you have a clean, flat, and sturdy surface. You should also have a mat, preferably an anti-static mat, but in a pinch, you can always use the box that your motherboard came in. You will need a PH2 screwdriver, Plus, you should also have some isopropyl alcohol and something to wipe with. Now, to install this cooler onto AM4 or AM5, you will need the backplate that came with your motherboard. With the backplate flat on the mat and the CPU installed into the motherboard, align the holes on the motherboard to the standoffs on the backplate. Then, with the motherboard flat, place the AMD plastic spacers over each hole. Now, you'll need to find the AMD mounting bars and the AMD mounting screws. Place the mounting screws through the holes on the mounting bars, then align the mounting screws to the plastic spacers, making sure that the mounting bars face in towards the CPU. Once you have, screw the mounting screws into the holes on the backplate. Once the mounting bars are installed, it's time to clean off the CPU with the isopropyl alcohol. And if you haven't already, this would be a good time to install your RAM, because once you've installed the cooler, you will no longer be able to install the RAM where at least it will be very, very difficult. Once you're ready, apply the provided or your own thermal compound to the CPU's IHS. Now making sure to remove the fan from the heatsink and the sticker from the bottom of the cold plate. Place the heatsink cold plate down onto the CPU's IHS, making sure to align the screw threads on the mounting bars to the spring retention screws on the fastening bar. Now screw the two spring retention screws on the fastening bar to the mounting bars. You will need to place the screwdriver through the holes on the heatsink to do this. Once that's done, install the fan onto the heatsink and plug in the PWM connector to your motherboard. And that's the installation. 
Now I'll go over the fan's PWM range. So at 100%, this motherboard is showing the RPM jumping between 2080-ish and 2190-ish, which is a bit odd. So I used my tachometer and got a consistent 2140 RPM, and that had a DBA of 37.7, taken from 20 inches away on an open air test bench. Dropping it down to 0%, and this motherboard is showing the RPM at 550-ish, and that has the DBA at or below my noise floor of 32. And that's it for the PWM range testing of this fan. Now, before I go on to the temperature charts, if you are liking this video and are appreciating all the testing I've done here, then please consider supporting the channel by using the Amazon Associates links in the description. All you need to do is click on the link that suits your location, and when you add an item or items to your cart and order them, the channel will get a small kickback at no added cost to you. If you haven't watched my CPU cooler testing methodology video, I strongly suggest you do. It's where I go over the how and what of my CPU cooler testing. I'll have a card above and I will also have it linked in the description. With that all done, onto the temperature charts. So the SI100 in my 65 watt test, when having the fan noise equalized to 35 dBA, had the CPU's average steady state temperature at 60.4 C. Then with the fan running at full speed, the average steady state CPU temperature was 59.6. So only a 0.8 Celsius difference between the 35 dBA and full speed tests. Moving on to my 87 watt test, with the fan noise equalized to 35 dBA, the CPU's average steady state temperature was at 74.6 C. Then with the fan running at full speed, the CPU's average steady state temperature was 73.8 C. So again, only a 0.8 C difference between the 35 dBA and full speed test. Now for my 150 watt test, having the fan noise equalized to 35 dBA had the CPU's average steady state temperature at 82.6 C. Then with the fan at full speed, the CPU's average steady state temperature was 81.6 C. So this time a one Celsius difference between the 35 dBA and full speed test, which is really not much at all. So what do I think of the Thermalright SI100 low profile CPU cooler? First off, its performance for a 23 USD cooler is pretty good. Plus I'm pretty sure the white ARGB version looks amazing for only four USD more. The issue that I have with this cooler is the size. Most standard cases will fit a 155-ish millimeter tower. And the ones, or at least most of the ones that don't, are then more like 40 to 50 millimeter max range on that. So I understand there will be some cases that will fall into this size that it'll, this will likely be the best case scenario for, but those cases will be few and far between. What I'm trying to say is if you want the best performance and your case can support a tower cooler, it makes more sense to go with the tower cooler. However, if you like the way this cooler looks is a good enough reason for me to get this cooler. You just need to understand you'll be getting a good enough performance opposed to the best performance. So just having that understanding that a tower cooler is going to perform better than this outside of that, it performs well enough. Finally, if you do like the look of this cooler and you're thinking of getting it, you should know that it is possible to spin the heatsink so that it's actually facing more towards the rear of the motherboard, which would remove the RAM clearance issues, meaning you could have ARGB dims with this cooler. I did all my testing with the fan over the RAM. My thought process was this would help cool the RAM, so that makes the most sense to me is to have the best performance. Not to say that the RAM needs extra cooling, but that was what I was thinking. Now having the cooler orientated this way may also depend on your motherboard and the VRM heatsink on your motherboard. Because if you're blasting the top of that heatsink, I feel like it's just going to bounce back, creating some weird turbulence and maybe not cool the CPU correctly. I don't know if that's really true. And again, if you're in a case, you'd have up and outward airflow opposed to just being in an open air test bench like I have here. Well, that's all I got for this one. So if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're still watching and you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you get notified whenever I drop a new video. 
There is also the HFG Discord server. It is completely free to join. All you need to do is agree to the server roles, and then you can see all of my charts. A link is in the description. There is also Patreon if you'd like to support the channel directly. Again, a link is in the description. You may want to check out this video here. It should be along the same lines of this video you just watched. And as always, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.